بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الف لام اللہ لا الہ الا هو الحی القیوم الف لام میم اللہ there is no deity except him the ever living the sustainer of existence in the second and the starting verse of surah al imran allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains the concept of belief in the oneness of allah and has also explained the greatest name and attribute of allah ismi azam for which Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has guided all of us in a tradition that he said that search for the greatest name isme azam of Allah in three verses the verse of the throne of surah al-baqarah the second verse of surah al-imran and the verse number 111 of surah taha and when we see the common word in all the three verses is al hayyul qayyum so this is the greatest attribute of allah almighty and then prophet sallallahu added that whoever will recite it before a supplication the supplication will be answered and it will be granted so this verse highlights the the greatest attribute of allah is that he is the ever living and the sustainer of existence and we learn that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the time of distress the supplication he used to make is was ya hayyu ya qayyum bi rahmatika nastaghith he has sent down upon you the book in truth confirming what was before it and he revealed the torah and the injil quran is saying the verse of the surah is saying that quran confirms what was in the books previously because we know that and we can clearly relate that all the concepts of faith and belief are similar in the books and similarly the narrations of the hell fire the narrations of jannah the commandments the orders the do's the don'ts the laws which have been basically explained in quran are almost similar to those which have been explained in the previous scriptures also and then here allah is mentioning about torah and about injil torah was the book which was revealed the the divine scripture which was revealed to hazrat musa alay salam it is also known as the old testament and it has 34 to 38 books similarly injil also known as the new testament this is composed of it is not composed of the words of the revelations from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instead it is generally composed of the speeches which were delivered by hazrat isa alayhi salam after he revealed uh, received the revelations and it is composed of 20 to 25 different volumes which make up the injil before as guidance for the people and he revealed the quran indeed those who did disbelieved in the verses of allah will have a severe punishment and allah is exalted in might the owner of retribution so here allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is labeling the quran is calling the quran as furqan furqan derives uh, from the word faraqa which means what which means to differentiate to distinguish so quran differentiates and distinguishes between what between the right and the wrong between the permissible and the prohibited between the halal and the haram between the lawful and the unlawful between sin and between the pious and the righteous deeds <coughs> اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه اللهم ارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه indeed from allah nothing is hidden in the earth nor in the heaven it is he who forms you in the wombs however he wills there is no deity except him the exalted in might the wise it is he who has sent down to you o muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the book in it are verses that are precise they are the foundation of the book and the other are unspecific so now here in this verse number 7 allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining to all of us that whenever you read and recite the quran you will come across two type of verses the first type is 
of his, uh, as Allah explains in this verse is muhkimat. These verses are the precise and the clear cut uh, messages of Allah. These are the verses, the meaning of which, the message of which, the commandment of which, the explanation of which, the narration of which, they are what? They are very precise and they're clear cut and they're very legible. They're very easy to comprehend and understand. These are all the verses of Quran re related with the articles of faith and belief about the do's, don'ts, commandments, orders, laws, and uh, the, the, the narrations of the life of hereafter, the day of judgment, Jannah, hell. These are what? These are the muhkimat, and they are the foundation of the book. And the other are which after saying that they are ayat, uh, ayatu muhkimatun hunna umul kitab, the other is wa ukharu mutashabihat. The others, the forms are, which are mutashabihat, they are the non-specific. Mutashabihat refers to the verses of Quran, uh, the meaning of which says doubtful. They are confusing. They are not specific. These are those verses, the message of which is not clear cut, and it is not easy to interpret the meaning of these verses. Some uh, commentaries say that they, they are nine in number. Somewhere we find that they are 17. Some say that they are 21 in number. Like example is that as Allah says in Quran, So the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is it like? Where is it? What is it made up of? What is its position? What is its shape? We just cannot comprehend. We cannot, we cannot understand and relate. So this is what? This is a mutashabihat. Then Allah says in Quran, So what is the position, the attitude? We, we just cannot comprehend. So these are all examples of what? Of the non-specific verses of Quran. We cannot understand the meaning and the meaning stays doubtful and confusing. So then after this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as for those in whose hearts is a deviation from truth, they will follow that of it which is unspecific, seeking discord and seeking an interpretation suitable to them. And no one knows its true interpretation except Allah, but those affirm in knowledge. Those firm in knowledge say, we believe in it and all of it is from our Lord. And no one will be reminded except those of understanding. So now, uh, after explaining that when we read the Quran, we're going to come across two types of verses. Now here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the next part of the verse explains that there are also going to be two types of people. When we, oh, people who read the Quran, who recite the Quran, who try to learn the Quran, they will all not be of the same type. They will also be of two types. The first type of the person which has been explained in this verse is a person with a crooked mind. The person with a crooked mind having a negative approach and outlook. He, the person will just pursue and just connect with the mutashabihat with the with the non-specific verses and they will try to do what they out of total self-delusion they will try to give them the meaning they would want to desire themselves to cause a deviation in islam so these are the crooked minded negative minded people who rather than connecting with the muhkimat they connect with the mutashabihat so they that they can give them a meaning a message which they desire themselves they desire for themselves as an ease in religion and they will cause a deviation in Islam. The second group of people who have been explained in this verse are the desired category as Allah explains, are the ulul albab. They are those who are the knowledgeable people. Who are these and how do they behave with the verses of Quran is that they relate with the muhkimat. And regarding the mutashabihat, they say, amanna bihi kullum min, uh, kullum, uh, they are all kullum in indi rabbina, that we believe in them. They are the mutashabihat. They are non-specific. They are doubtful. They are confusing. We do not understand and comprehend them. But since they have been revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we believe in them. And that is all. They do not behave in any crooked manner or any negative manner. 
And instead, they relate with the muhkimat, and they have a clear-cut, straight-forward behavior and mannerism while they are relating with Quran. So they gain what? They gain knowledge, and they gain they gain guidance from Quran. So we relate that to be from one of the knowledgeable ones, to be from one of those who gain guidance with Quran, we need to relate with what? We need to relate with the muhkimat verses, the clear-cut verses of Quran. And we need to behave in a manner, we need to behave in a clear-cut, straightforward manner without any form of crookedness in our manner and our relationship with the verses of Quran. <clears throat> And these knowledgeable people who have a straightforward relationship with the Quran, they supplicate and they say what? Rabbi habli milladunka. They say that our Lord, let not our hearts deviate. Rabbana la tuzir qulubana. Ba'da is hadaytana. Wa hablana milladunka rahma. Innaka antal wahab. They say our Lord, let not our hearts deviate after you have guided us and grant us from yourself mercy. Indeed, you are the bestower. <clears throat> so their supplication is what we made in the end of our sessions. And that is why they make their supplication. The reason why they make their supplication is that our Lord, surely you will gather the people for a day about which there is no doubt. Indeed, Allah does not fail in his promise. So out of fear of her hereafter and out of making preparations for their eternal abode, they make supplications to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to prevent their hearts from any form of crookedness and any form of deviation from the true teachings of the Quran. Indeed, those who disbelieve, never will their wealth or their children avail them against Allah at all. It is they who are the fuel for fire. Allahumma la taj'alna minhum, Allahumma ajirna minan nar. Theirs is like the custom of the people of Pharaoh and those before them, they denied our signs. So Allah sees them for their sins and Allah is severe in penalty. Verse number 12, say to those who disbelieve, you will be overcome and gathered together to hell and wretched is the resting place. Allahumma ajirna minan nar, Allahumma ajirna minan nar, Allahumma ajirna minan nar. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has promised all of us that the person who seeks, who supplicates for release from the hellfire, then the hellfire itself intercedes for the person. Verse number 13, already there has been for you a sign in the two armies which met. Which two armies? The armies of the Muslims and the armies of the Quraysh of Makkah. When? Uh, during the battle of Badr, the two armies which met, one fighting in the cause of Allah, was the strength of what? A strength of 313 mujahideen of Islam who left Medina to confront what? Another of the disbelievers, an army of 1,000 soldiers under the, under the leadership of whom? Abu Jahl, marching from, uh, uh, marching from Makkah towards Medina. They saw them to be twice their own number by their eyesight, by Allah supported with his victory, whom he wills. Indeed, in that is a lesson for those of vision. Allah supports whom? Who obey them, who obey Allah and his prophets, and who stay steadfast in their patience of obedience, and they are reliant on Allah. Allahumma ja'alni saburun wa ja'alni shakura. Beautified for people is the love of that which they desire of women and sons heaped up sums of gold and silver fine branded horses and cattle and tilled lands that is the enjoyment of worldly life but Allah has for him the best return. In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving a list of all the worldly things whose love, whose attraction is deep rooted in the hearts of the human beings, the tempting, the alluring things of the world. Allah has labeled them as hubbush shahawat, 
the list of all the tempting things. These are the things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned that Allah has infused. Allah has instinct the desire, the love, and the want of all these things in the human instinct. It is instinctive for human beings to desire them, to want them. So how do we need to behave and how do we need to relate with these tempting things of the world is remember that desiring them having having supplicating for them trying to work or to strive or struggle to acquire them to possess them and to have them or to use them i repeat again regarding these tempting things of the worldly life to desire them, to have a want for them, to supplicate for them, to try to work and uh, to acquire them and to possess and own and keep them or to use them in this worldly life. This is neither is it unlawful nor is it haram or prohibited and it is not even disliked or discouraged. On the contrary, it is totally permissible this all state of affairs regarding these tempting things of the world, since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made them instinctively attractive for us, then it is totally permissible and it is also allowed. And especially if a person is working and struggling to earn halal and lawful livelihood, this becomes what? This becomes an act of worship. And this is not disliked and it is not unlawful. So what we need to do is, that these are, we need to realize that these are trials of the world and we do not need to walk out of them or we do not need to uh, have a state of abstinence from them and we need do not need to stay away from them. What we need to uh, adopt in our lives is a balanced frame of mind and a balanced behavior is that if we need to if we need to acquire them we acquire them in a lawful manner uh abstaining and refraining from all forms of unlawful and uh unlawful and haram methods and similarly we can we can use them but we need to use them within the limits of allah and within the limits of uh, ordained by the quran and then we need to spend them in the path of allah in the for the sake of allah to make them what to make them a baqiyatu swalihat for all of us <clears throat> say shall i inform you of something better than that that what for all the worldly riches for those who fear Allah will be gardens in the presence of their Lord, beneath which rivers flow, wherein they will abide eternally and purified spouses and approval from Allah. And Allah is seeing of his servants. So here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning the bounties and blessings of Jannah for all those who do what? <coughs> who are the God-fearing servants of Allah. Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha, Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha, Allahumma inni as'aluka al-huda wal-tuka wal-arfafa wal-ghina. Those who say, our Lord, indeed we have believed, so forgive us our sins and protect us from the punishments of fire. So the bounties and blessings of Jannah for previous verse number 15 have been mentioned for the God-fearing and in this verse have been mentioned for those who are repentant and seek forgiveness from Allah. Allahumma ja'alni min al-tawwabina wa ja'alni min al-mutatwakhirin. Rabbi ghfir wa arham wa anta khayru rahimin. Allahumma ghfir lana walil mu'minina wal mu'minat wal muslimina wal muslimat. Rabbana zulamna anfusana wa illam taghfir lana wa tarhamna lanakunanna min al-khasirin. The patient, the true, the obedient, those who spent in the way of Allah and those who seek forgiveness before dawn. Allah witnesses there is no deity except him and so do the angels and those of knowledge that he is maintaining creation in justice. There is no deity except him, the exalted in might, the wise. Verse number 19, indeed, the religion in the sight of Allah is Islam. Allah says, 
Islam, and those who were given the scriptures did not differ except after knowledge had come to them out of jealous enormity between themselves. And whoever disbelieves in the verses of Allah, then indeed Allah is swift in taking account. Allahumma hasibna hisabi yasira. Allah clearly and in a clear cut verse of Surah Al Imran has announced in the in the Lahil Islam. What do we mean? That Allah says that there is no religion accepted in the sight of Allah other than the religion of Islam. What do we mean by deen? Deen or religion means it is, it does not just mean a few rituals. Deen and religion means a complete code of life a complete code of life, a complete mode of ethics. So the only acceptable code of life and the only acceptable mode of ethics in the sight of Allah on the day of judgment for all the bondsmen will be what a life spent according to the teachings of Quran and Hadith, according to the teachings of Islam. And Allah has clearly announced in a verse, On the day of judgment, the only code of life acceptable from the bondsman will be that which has been explained by Allah Almighty as Islam. Any deeds, <clears throat> any deeds, any activities, any style of life, however successful it might seem in the worldly life, however attractive or however impressive it might be in this worldly life, but any lifestyle, any mode of life, any code of ethics, any deeds which are against the code of life explained by Quran and Hadith and the religion of Islam, they will be rejected and discarded. They will be disregarded and not accepted on the day of judgment. So if they argue with you, say, I have submitted myself to Allah in Islam, and so have those who follow me, and say to those who were given the scripture and to the unlearned, have you submitted yourself? And if they submit in Islam, they are rightly guided. But if they turn away, then upon you is only the duty of notification. And Allah is seeing of his servants. So this is what Allah demands in Islam, is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala desires. The words explain what Islam demands of the Muslims and what Allah desires from his bondsmen is submission. It's submission and total surrendering for the will of Allah, for the player of Allah. Surrendering from what? Surrendering from all the desires, from all our wills and wants and requirements to be what? To be obedient and submissive servants of Allah. Those who disbelieve in the signs of Allah and kill the prophets without right and kill those who order justice from among the people, give them tidings of a painful punishment. The people of Bani Israel, they used to kill their prophets and the punishment for them, the painful punishment for them is being mentioned in this verse. Like they killed Hazrat Zakriya alayhi salam. They killed Hazrat Yahya alayhi salam. Hazrat Yarmiya alayhi salam. These, these prophets and messengers of Allah, they, they were killed and they were assassinated by the people of Bani Israel. And moreover, not only this, they attempted they attempted the killing of Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam by trying to throw him in the fire. They, uh, as is mentioned in Surah Mumin, that Fir'aun, he planned to kill Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. And uh, the Christians, they, the people in the period of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, they planned to crucify him. And last but not the least, Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam against him. There were 17 assassination attempts planned against Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked that who, which group of people or who will suffer the greatest punishment on the day of judgment. And he answered that all those who killed the prophets and killed those who, who, were, who were working to order justice from among the people. That is, they were who? 
they were the followers and the heirs and the vices to the prophets that they were the people who had taken up the mission of preaching and teaching and implementation of Islam as missions of their life. They are the ones whose deeds have become worthless in this world and hereafter, and for them there will be no helpers. Do you not consider those who were given a portion of the scripture? They are invited to the scripture of Allah, that it should uh, uh, arbitrate between them. Then a party of them turns away, and they are refusing. That is because they say, never will the fire touch us except for a few numbered days. And because they were deluded in their religion by what they were inventing. So in this verse number 24, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned a false claim, some wrong beliefs and delusions of the people of the book. Allah mentions very frequently in Quran that they used to say that fire will not touch us except for a few numbered days. And which numbered days uh, did they mention? The Jews said that they used to say that for the 40 days we worship the golden calf, we will be just given the punishment of hellfire. And the Christians, they were even more, they were even more deluded. They used to say that the, the crucifixion which Hazrat Isa was subjected to, this was a source of purification and exemption of all the sins for the whole of the believers and the followers of Hazrat Isa salam. And this crucifixion of Hazrat Isa itself was an atonement for the sins of all the followers of Hazrat Isa And they also used to say, Nahnu abna Allah, that we are the sons of Allah. Nahnu ahibahu, that we are the beloveds of Allah. And so assuming these all false assumptions, they had invented that they will not be put in the hellfire. So Allah says, so how will it be when we assemble them for a day about which there is no doubt and each soul will be compensate, com compensated in full for what it earned and they will not be wrong. Say, O oh Allah, owner of sovereignty, you give sovereignty to whom you will and you take sovereignty away from whom you will, your honor to whom you will, you humble whom you will, in your hand is all good. Indeed, you are over all things competent. You cause the night to enter the day. You cause the day to enter the night. You bring the living out of the dead and you bring the dead out of the living and you give provisions to whom you will without account. So beautifully explained, powers and attributes of and the authority of Allah Almighty. Let not believers take disbelievers as allies rather than believers. And whoever of you does that has nothing with Allah except when taking precaution against them in prudence. And Allah warns you of himself and to Allah is the final destination. So here in this verse, <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us about our social dealings and human relationships and interactions. <coughs> Allah is addressing all the believers not to take the disbelievers as allies. So now we have to understand and relate that with whom, with whom, how, what, where can we and should we relate, behave, and interact? And this is what we are learning from this verse. To comprehend all this, that how do we have to go about our social dealings and with our human dealings, we need to understand the basic human dealings are of four types. Four types of human dealings and relationships do we come across while we are socially interacting with people. The first type of human dealing is dealings of the simple interactions, like 
in our our day-to-day -day life, we come across people around us with whom we interact and we deal in a minimal form, like we go to a marketplace and there we deal with the green grocer or the person who is selling the fruit, or we go up to we go out to pick up our child from the school and we relate with a mother of another child. So with all these people, we have nothing in common. We don't have any bond of relationship. We don't have anything in common, no sharing, no acquaintance, and we might not just even come across again. So this is the most non-reactive and the most simplest forms of interactions. The second form of dealing we come across in our social life is a dealing of hospitality. That is like when a person comes across, when a person comes to our house, we do what? We, out of sheer politeness and courtesy, we extend our hospitality. So this is the second form of a comparatively more interactive form of human dealing. The third form of dealing we come across is a dealing of care and support. We find a person who is needy, needy of help and support, and we extend our help and support to the person. We find a person is crying and we wipe off the tears and we, we try to console and comfort the person. And we find that a person is sick and we pay a visit to the sick person. This is all thought. This is a dealing of care and support and this is more interactive and this is somehow more intimate also. The fourth form of dealing, which has been labeled as vala, the dealing of vala is a dealing of love, intimacy, closeness, and nearness. Now, I would want to clearly highlight some specifications which would clarify this type of relationship is, that is, what is vala and what is this form of relationship is, that it is a, a deep, heartfelt bond of love and affection. It is a very sincere form of relationship in which there is a deep heartfelt bond of love and affection. It is a near and a dear bond. We confide with each other. We share our secrets with each other. And the two people, they will be counseling with each other, taking each other's advice regarding certain matters in their life and then they will be they will be copying they will be following each other they will be idolizing each other and copying each other and then there will be a sharing of uh, the entertainments and enjoyments as well so this form of relationship has been is a relationship of mutual love the near and the dear ones, they, this is the relationship mentioned in Quran as well. Now, having understood all these four forms of human and social relations and dealings, next we need to understand that how we believers, we are supposed to interact in all these four forms. Now, remember, the first four forms of human relationships the first the first three forms of human relationships that is the relationships of simple interaction of hospitality or the relationships of care and support it is not for the believers it is not for all of us that we can i'm not saying that we can but it is that we should it is not that we can but it is that we should with all these three forms, we should behave with a good conduct, with a good manner, with a polite behavior, with a kind attitude, with all these three forms, with all the religions, with all the sects, with all the nations, whether they are believers, whether they are non-believers, whether they are Muslims, non-Muslims, they are obedience, they are transgressors. In any form, the first three forms of human relationships, the Muslims should behave in a perfect conduct, manner, behavior, kindness of attitude in all the relationships. And the purpose why is the first three forms of relationships have to be adopted with Muslims in this perfect conduct with all the human beings is why. The first purpose is that Muslims 
as Muslims, we need to learn knowledge, skill, trade to be able to prosper. So we need to relate with, with all the people of the world. The second thing is that we will have to trade. We will have to make business dealings with people. And this will be what? This will be a source of livelihood for the Muslims. Because if we do not do all that, then Muslims will tend to stay behind. They will tend to lag behind the race of progress and development. And we would tend to stay underdeveloped and we would stay behind in the race of this life. So to advance and to have progress, we need to relate with the people of all the world in various fields of life. And we need to do that in which manner we need to have the first three forms of relationships with a total good, proper conduct and manner with all the world and internationally. And the second reason why we need to behave with the proper conduct with everyone around us in these three relationships is that the excellent conduct and the proper manner and the behavior of the Muslims with all the non-Muslim world will also be a source of a silent invitation towards Islam. When all the non-Muslims, when they will see the polite and the courteous, the caring manner and the conduct of the Muslims, they will be obviously attracted towards Islam. So this will be a silent method of inviting people towards Islam. But remember the last form of human relationship, the relationship of a wala, which I have explained as the most intimate relationship between the two people. This last form of human dealing, Quran gives a very clear cut instructions that this has not to be Muslims. All the Muslims, they are not permitted to take as a wala who all the non-believers and the disbelievers, the non-Muslims, this is what we are being guided in this verse number 28, that all the Muslims and all the believers, they it is not permitted for them. It is not lawful for them that they take the disbelievers and the non-Muslims in a relationship of Allah. And then as we proceed in the next surahs of Quran, we will learn that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also instruct us and order and enjoin the Muslims not to take the people of the book also for their wala. The Jews and the Muslims also, we, we do not have to, we have to refrain from making a relationship of wala with even the Jews and the Christians. And then finally, in Surah Tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also ask the Muslims to avoid relationship of wala with even, with even the brothers or the fathers if they prefer disobedience over obedience of Allah. That is, if the fathers and the brothers also prefer to stay in a state of disobedience to Allah, then the Muslims and the believers will be kind to them, will be supportive and caring to them, will be polite and merciful to them, and will extend their hospitality to them, no doubt. But there will be no relationship of wala with such a father and such a brother also. So this is what we are not even with hypocrites or with the disobedience or the transgressors will the Muslims have a relationship of wala. What? Why is this so? The reason is that if a believer, if a believer, if a Muslim starts following, copying, idolizing, or sharing secrets or taking advices from a hypocrite or from a disobedient person or from a transgressor, then what will happen is that obviously his model will be of uh, his his model will be of disobedience and transgression. His advice will be of disobedience and transgression, and this will lead to what? This will weaken. This will weaken the faith and will damage their belief. That is why, in clear cut orders, a believer is supposed to avoid this form of relationship with nobody other than people of strong faith and strong belief. Wala will only be permitted for the believers with the believing, obedient Muslims of, and servants of Allah. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand all the concepts of uh, relationships with the human beings around us and accept and obey the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Verse number 29, say whether you conceal what is in your breast or reveal it, Allah knows it. And he knows that which is in the heavens and that which is on the earth. And Allah is over all things competent. So here from this verse, what we realize is that Allah knows what Allah is all knowing. He is all seeing and hearing. And not only does he know what we we reveal he knows also what we conceal so the importance of realizing this is that it is not only our our, our external and our outwardly appearance that we need to make it according to the teachings of quran but we also need to do what what we conceal, what we have hidden, our secret personalities and our inner self also, we need to reform. Our, our hearts, our souls, we need to purify from within also. As Prophet Sallallahu has been reported in a tradition, he said that there is a peace in the body. There is a part of the body that if it stays pure, the whole body stays pure. And if it is spoiled, the whole of the body is spoiled. Remember, be aware, the part of the body is the heart. This is the part of the body for which Prophet Sallallahu was pointing towards it. And he was saying, taqwa ha huna, taqwa ha huna, taqwa ha huna. This is heart. It is the soul where the piety resides where the piety resides allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha allahumma alhimna rushdan wa aizna min shuroori anfusina the day every soul will find what it has done of good present before it and what it has done of evil it will wish that between itself and that evil was a great distance and allah warns you of himself and allah is kind to his servants say if you should love Allah, then follow me. So Allah will love you and forgive you your sins. And Allah is forgiving and merciful. So here in this verse, number 31, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining and narrating a method to purify the souls. Allah says that if all of you believers Oh, believers, if you claim, if you announce, if you declare that you love Allah, then to prove the truth of your claim, the truth of your declaration, you have to do what? You have to follow, you have to copy, idealize and glamorize his beloved prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How can you truly love Allah? How can you truly love Allah if you don't love and follow his beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And then Allah promises the rewards for following a Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The two rewards are, Allah says, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي That if you love Allah, then follow, copy, idealize, glamorize the sunnahs of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the teachings of hadith of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then when you do these, that you start obeying the messages of hadith and you start following the sunnah of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what two rewards will you get? Allah, Allah, he himself will start loving you. If you obey and follow the sunnahs and teachings of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah's beloved, then you will come up within the list of those who are the beloveds of Allah. And the second reward is, He will forgive your sins. He will forgive your sins. What else can we all desire? What else can we all want to be included in the list of those who are the beloveds of Allah and to be forgiven all the sins and this this all, these two rewards and these all two rewards of Allah, we can achieve how? By following the sunnah of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is why we keep on urging and we, can't, we keep on insisting to all the believers to follow 
to follow the sunnahs of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you know, there are crooked minded people, the so-called intellectuals with a crooked mind, they generally raise the accusation and they generally oppose and they generally criticize that it is all those people who are preaching and teaching. They keep on inviting people towards these small sunnahs, na'uzubillah, na'uzubillah, minzalik, these petty small sunnahs of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. After all, what difference does it make? They are critical enough, na'uzubillah, to say, they have the audacity to say that what difference does it make? That which, which shoe do I wear first? And which pair of socks do I take off first? And which, which shirt, which side of the shirt do I insert my arm first? And which, which arm do I take out first? And which part of the head do I comb first? And how do I eat? And how do I walk? And what do I say when I climb the stairs? What, what difference does it make? You know, this, this verse tells us which, what difference does it make? This verse explains what difference does it make when we follow the sunnah. A person following the sunnah becomes a beloved of Allah. And a person following the sunnah in any action, in any deed, will all the sins be forgiven? And you know what? There's another thing which I would want to explain regarding the following of sunnah and regarding the idealizing and glamorizing of Prophet Sallallahu is, remember, that during the daytime when we are up and we are doing something, if we do it out of our own way and the way we want to and the way we adopt, only and only that task and the job will be done. But if we, if we do that work or we carry on this activity according to the sunnah of Prophet Sallallahu the way Prophet Sallallahu used to do that activity, then doing that piece of work and carry on, carrying on that activity will be what? Will be an act of worship. And this activity will be rewarded as a good deed, will be recorded as a righteous deed in our records of deeds and it will be it will be added in the weights of the good deeds on the day of judgment like if we are drinking from a glass of water and we drink it the way we want to only what will happen is that we will drink and we will quench our thirst and that is it that is all what we will gain out of it but if we drink water as per the Sunnah of Prophet Sallallahu we sit down and we don't breathe inside the glass and we take it, we drink it in forms of three sips, stopping in between. Then we are drinking this water out of the glass according to the Sunnahs of Prophet Sallallahu This drinking of water will also be an act of worship. It will be, it will be a source of reward of good deeds and this will this will make us be one of the beloveds of Allah. And this will make us, this will be a source of, a source of forgiveness of our sins. So why is it not a good deal to adopt the sunnahs of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? It's not going to hurt us. It is not going to make us do something extra. We have to do all these activities in our life in any case. We are, we are from morning to evening, we are carrying on all these activities in any case. But if we carry on all the activities of our life from morning to evening, according to the sunnahs of Prophet Sallallahu they will be what? They will be rewarded. They will be good deeds for all of us. So this is a very easy deal for all of us to convert the whole of our life activities from morning till evening into acts of worship. That is why, that is why I will always urge all of you to adopt the sunnahs of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's life so that our life can become a complete act of worship from morning till evening. And not only for ourselves, we need to teach all these little sunnahs of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's daily life activities to our children also. Because you know, to these little ones, a child, three to four years of age, obviously what else about religion, what else about Islam are we going to teach the little child, the little mind? We, we are at this state of his life. We are obviously not going to teach him about the laws of Allah or about the concepts of gambling or intoxicants. We are not going to teach him about the concepts of debt and will in Islam. No, 
the max possible we can teach him or introduce him to is the Sunnah of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his in his small little life, in his little heart, in his little mind, infusing the love of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by introducing him to these Sunnahs of life, Sunnahs of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's life. When he's entering the washroom, the mother just holds the hand and says, no, no, my son, just put this foot first. Why, mommy? Because Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi told us to do this. He did it like this. When he starts eating, I hold the hand and tell, no, Sonny, just, just recite Bismillah. Why, mommy? Because Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do it this way. So this will be introducing Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to him. It will be infusing the love of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to him. And you know what? Another thing is, it will be just like teaching a kindergarten child, like a kindergarten child, a child in Montessori, we teach them one, two, three, basic counting. And we, we see that in no, just, just a few years, in a matter of few years, the person, the child, we had taught one, two, three in the Montessori. Within a few years, the child comes up solving huge sums of trigonometry and complicated complicated questions of logarithms. Similarly, in a Montessori class or in a preschool class, we are teaching what? We're just teaching ABC. And then in a few years, the child is one who is capable of reading complicated comprehensions and answering them. So this is it. We get the child used to small sunnahs of Prophet Sallallahu day-to-day life. And inshallah, when the ch- child will be a mature adult Muslims, it will be very easy for him to adopt the, the greater sunnahs of Prophet Sallallahu also. Allahumma inni as'aluka hubbaka wa hubba man yuhibbuka wa amal allazi yuballighuni hubbaka. Say, obey Allah and the messenger, but if they turn away, then indeed Allah does not like the disbelievers. Indeed, Allah chose Adam alayhi salam and Nu alayhi salam and the family of Ibrahim alayhi salam and the family of Imran over the worlds. So in these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse 33, from here, will start the second part of the chapter or of the of Surah Al-Imran. These verses from starting from verse number 33, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed uh, in the ninth year after the immigration of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from Makkah to Medina, that is in ninth AH, were these verses of Surah Al-Imran, they were revealed and when there was a group of uh, the religious leaders of Christians, and they were the scholars from the from the people of Nijran, they came to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this was in 19 AH. And they came over to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to find out about his religion. And they asked Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as to what did the verses of Quran they have to say about Hazrat Isa Alaihi Salam and Hazrat Maryam Alaihi Salam. So uh, all these verses, in response to their question, to the, the question of the religious leaders and the scholars from the people of Nijran, uh, they had come as a group and uh, as uh, an answer to the question of the deposition from Nijran, these verses of Surah Al-Imran were revealed and these were then recited by Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the deposition of Nijran, answering them their questions. Now, in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the next few verses, is uh, relating the events of a chosen family, the chosen family of Ali Imran. For all of us, if we want to be among the chosen people, we, need, we will go through the verses and we will realize that whom Allah chooses, whom Allah chooses for his rahmah, for his blessings, for his radha, for his player, for his love, for his forgiveness, his mercy, for whom Allah chooses out of his bondsmen. We will read the whole narration and inshallah, we will try to learn, we will try to remember and adopt the traits and the manners of the chosen people. 
Allah says, descendants, some of them from others, and Allah is hearing and knowing. Verse number 35 mentioned when the wife of Imran, Imra Atu Imran, she said, who do, uh, who do we mean by Imra Atu Imran, the lady or the wife of Imran, it means whom? It is, it is referring to the mother of Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam because we learn by tradition that Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam's father's name was Imran. So that is why her mother has been called as Imra to Imran. The second thing which we find in certain commentaries is that Imra to Imran has been, uh, the mother of Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam has been called as Imra to Imran because um, uh, the brother of Hazrat Musa alayhi salam and Hazrat Harun alayhi salam or their father's name was Imran. So it refers to a lady who was in this family tree. So she said, what? The Imra to Imran, she said, my Lord, indeed, I have pledged to you what is in my womb, consecrated for your service. So accept this from me. Indeed, you are the hearing and knowing. So this lady in this family, she and she and her progeny was among the chosen. And why did Allah choose her? We will gather the points from the narration of this verse is that Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam's mother, she would conceive repeatedly, but every time she conceived, she the pregnancy would not go to full term and she would repeatedly abort. Then finally, she made this solemn pledge of sacrificing the child and with full sincerity and devotion, she, she presented and she sacrificed the child she had conceived that she will give away her child. She will give away her child and specify the child for the service of Allah Almighty and for the service of Deen and for the service of Islam. So Allah chose, so Allah chose her. Allah chooses whom? Allah chooses all those who sacrifice their beloved things, who sacrifice their beloved ones for the cause and for the sake of Allah, for the sake of spreading and preaching the messages of Allah. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. But when she delivered her, she said, my Lord, I have delivered a female. Because you know that she had uh, made the solemn pledge that she will sacrifice, she will free the child from all the worldly, uh, from all the worldly services and all the worldly activities and specify and devote the child for the service of the religion of Allah. She had most probably thought that it would be a son and she would make him a preacher and she would, and she would present him as a mujahid of Islam. But when she gave birth to a daughter, she was slightly upset and anxious because obviously, as she said, that a daughter is not like a son. She said, my Lord, I have delivered a female and Allah was most knowing of what she had delivered and male is not like a female. So, so initially she had a few reservations and she had a few um, concerns and she was slightly upset. But then she said, what? And I have named her as Maryam, and I seek refuge for her in you and for her descendants from Trayatan, the expelled from the mercy of Allah. So initially she had a bit, a few reservations and she was slightly constrained because obviously she said that a daughter cannot be like a son. A woman is obviously, it is difficult for her to perform all these services and activities, but in any case, she named her Maryam. This name itself, itself shows that despite her concern for it being a baby girl, she fulfilled her pledge. She fulfilled her pledge because the name Maryam, it means what? It means the one who serves, the one who serves Allah, the one who serves and worships the religion. So the name itself meant that she fulfilled her pledge and she fulfilled the oath she had taken for the service of her child. And then she supplicated, Inni Uizuha Bika wa min Regarding this part of the verse, we learn from a tradition of Prophet that uh, he has informed all of us that when a baby is born, 
that whenever a baby is born, the shaitan pinches the newborn baby. And it is because of this that the baby cries and the baby howls. But Prophet ﷺ said that only two babies, they were protected from this act of shaitan. One was Hazrat Isa salam and Hazrat Maryam salam, And this was because of the dua, the supplication their mother had made. So these, <coughs> we need to remember this verse, inni u'izuha bika wa zurriyatiha min shaitwani rajim, which saved Hazrat Isa salam and Hazrat Maryam salam from the from the shaitan and from the act of shaitan, they were saved and they were in the protection of Allah. So when do we need to recite it? Whenever a woman delivers a baby or whenever we are around our daughters or our sisters having at the time of a delivery, we need to remember this verse of Surah Al-Imran, the verse, this part of the verse number 36 of, uh, of Surah Al-Imran, and we need to recite it ourselves or we need to recite when we are around the time of delivery of our sisters and daughters or daughter-in-laws, and we also need to uh, pass on this information to all our Muslims sisters <coughs> so her lord accepted her with good acceptance and caused her to grow in a good manner and put her in care of zakaria every time zakaria entered her upon her in the prayer chamber he found with her provisions he said oh mariam from where is this coming to you? She said, it is from Allah. Indeed, Allah provides for whom he wills without any account. So from here in this verse, we learn that when um, the mother, a mother of Hazrat Maryam salam, she presented her daughter for the cause of the preaching and teaching of Islam and for the service of Islam. She was uh, made to stay and reside in Hekle Salimani of Baytul Maktas. And there she was, uh, she stayed there for the purpose of learning of the messages of Allah, for the purpose of teaching and preaching of Islam in future. Now, what happened there? Now, what happened there? This is what is important to relate for all of us. Because, you know, today, today, parents, they have inhibitions to connect their children with Quran. Mothers, they have inhibitions and they have reservations to connect their daughters with Quran, with the, with the learning of Quran and with the teachings of Quran. And the main, mainly the points are the fear which the parents and the mothers have regarding connection, connecting their daughters daughters and children with the study of Quran, with the learning of Quran, the fear is generally the social factors. The social factors, the first being that they think that when they will connect their daughter or their child with Quran, the child or the daughter will become a fanatic. The child would turn into an orthodox Muslim and they might end up as a social misfit individuals. They might turn out to be social outcasts or social misfits they might come out to be. The second fear is generally that, for example, if a daughter, the mothers, they assume that if a daughter reads the Quran and, and, and studies the Quran and starts adopting the Quran, then the daughter, once she starts adopting the Islamic dress code, she might, she might face issues regarding regarding her marriage she might start facing issues while finding an appropriate match in the society the third problem which generally people think is that if a daughter she starts reading the quran and she starts uh, learning the quran she will get deprived of the worldly education and she will not have any professional education once she does not have a worldly professional education she will suffer from economic crises in her life so let's just see that when the mother of Hazrat Maryam salam, she presented her daughter Hazrat Maryam for the service of Islam, for the learning of the messages of Allah and the commandments of Allah, what did happen? Did anything of this sort happen in this case? What happened? Allah says, so Lord accepted her. Her Lord accepted her with good acceptance and caused her to grow in a good manner. So did she become a misfit? She, did she become a social outcast? 
No, Allah accepted her and Allah caused her to grow in a good manner as a pious, as a righteous individual. She was not a social misfit. She was not a social outcast. Now, what about her provisions? What about her provisions? Did she suffer from economic crisis? And who took care of her? Did she not find anybody to protect her, to take care of her? Allah said, and Allah put her in the care of Zakaria. And how did Allah, did she face an economic crisis? Did she run short of any form of provisions? Where did her provisions come from? Zakaria al-Islam, when he used to enter upon her prayer chamber, he used to find with her provisions. And where were these provisions from? We learn from traditions that Zakaria alayhi salam, he used to see that there were fruits with her and there were provisions of fruits with her which, are, which were not seasonal. Out of season fruits were coming from where they were being sent to her from heaven. These were the fruits of Jannah. These were being sent to her from heavens by whom? Who was the sustainer? Who was the provider? This is the message of the verses. This is the message of this all story. Allah help us have faith. Allah help us have strong belief. Allah help us develop reliance and patience. Allah help us develop the fear of hereafter and be help us be all of those who present who present the best of our time, the best of our age, the best of our skills and knowledge and offsprings for the sake of service of Allah. Rabbana taqabbal minna and Allah when we present our time our energy, our wealth, our, our houses, our children, our knowledge, our skills for the sake of service of Allah in the path of Allah, for the teaching, for the preaching, for the missions of Dava, when we present all this, Allah accept it from us. Allah choose us for all this service of Islam. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka antas samiul alim. And at that, Zakaria salam called upon his Lord saying, my Lord, grant me from yourself a good offspring. He said, Rabbi habli min ladunka zurriyatan toyibatan inna ka dua. My Lord, grant me from yourself a good offspring. Indeed, you are the hearer of supplications. Now, has a Zakaria salam he he was he was experiencing what he saw such a pious such a pious worshiping maiden young girl and that she was being blessed by by the by the miraculous fruits from heavens and there he was has a zakaria he was old and his wife had been infertile. But seeing all these miracles and seeing this pious child, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam's mother, he had blessed Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam's mother, a pious daughter, a righteous daughter, when she had asked for, when she had supplicated to Allah, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was being kind and merciful to bless Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam with these miracle fruits. So there he was. He developed reliance. He developed faith. He developed, he developed belief in Allah, in the powers, in the authorities, in the sovereignty of Allah. And there he supplicated. There he supplicated with these words, Rabbi habli min ladunka zurriyatan toyibatan inna ka dua. These words that you are the hearer of supplication was his manner. Now when he supplicated in these words with reliance, how, where, and how was he answered? He was answered how? So the angel called to him, while he was standing in the prayer chamber, indeed, Allah gives you the good tidings of Yahya confirming a word from Allah and who will be honorable, abstaining from women and a prophet from among the righteous. So the dua, it reached the throne of Almighty Allah. This supplication was heard. It was accepted. It was granted with the grace of Allah. How was it granted? He was given the good news. He was given the good news 
not only the good news of the of a, of a conception but he was given the good news of the birth of a son even the name of the son yahya was suggested in the good news and it was told that this name has never been suggested for anyone before hazrat yahya his son he was also given the good news that his son suggested as the name of yahya he will be a prophet of allah and he was also good given the good news of all the good traits of his son also subhanallah subhanallah how was this supplication accepted in what merciful manner and what manner of blessing of allah was this supplication of hazrat yahya accepted so what do we learn from here that the supplications we are going to make in future are going to be the supplications suggested in quran and the supplications of prophets mentioned in quran so what advantage will we gain when we supplicate in the words of the supplications of prophets or in the words of the supplications of quran number 1 will be that we will be rewarded while supplicating we will be rewarded we will be rewarded with the recitation of quran and we will be rewarded because of following of the sunnah of a prophet and more reward these supplications they are tried supplications these are the supplications which have reached the throne of allah these are tried and accepted supplications so we need to use these for our supplications and moreover these supplications when we start using these words of supplications these are comprehensive and these are complete as contrast to the supplication incomplete supplications we generally tend to make these are comprehensive and they are complete and they are also those which will teach us how to the manner and the comprehension of how to supplicate we will also learn while we start adopting these words for our supplications now why was this supplication answered the first reason is what what was the manner of az zakaria alayhi salam he was saying wallah ma qum bi duai ka rabbi shaqiya and he was saying he was saying that i will always i've always been heard so this was reliance this was reliance and this was relying and this was understanding and comprehending and believing in the power in the authority and in the control and the sovereignty of allah so when we supplicate to allah with a sure mind with the reliance realizing and mentioning the attributes of allah inshallah those supplications will be heard and will be granted so we can we can supplicate with this supplication we can use this supplication when we want we are desirous for having our own offsprings when we are wanting to have our own offsprings or when we are uh, wanting to ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for grandchildren for children or for grandchildren or we want to ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that make for, for the reformation of our children as pious and righteous children even then we can we can use these words of uh, these words of the supplication and when we want to find uh, we want to find a spouse for our children a righteous and a pious match for our children also we can use the words of this supplication was number 41 he said my lord make for me a sign he said your sign is that you will not be able to speak to the people for 3 days except by gestures and remember your lord much and exalt him with praise in the evening and morning so you know when the angel came and gave the good news of the birth of hazrat yahya alayhi salam explaining and narrating all the attributes and his prophethood also then immediately hazrat yahya hazrat zakaria alayhi salam he said my lord make me make for me a sign because you know the level of the faith does not stay the same always he when he was observing hazrat maryam alayhi salam and he was 
experiencing, he was seeing all the miraculous fruits, then the level of faith and belief was at the height. And he was in an ultimate state of reliance. And he, that is why he supplicated. But immediately at a later stage, the faith slightly decreased. And there he was asking that make for me a sign. And then the angel replied, and the angel replied that the sign would be two things would we understand from the verse was he ordered by Allah. The first thing which has been explained in the commentary is that he will not be able to speak or he should not speak. So first is that Allah ordered him that you should not speak to people for three days. That is, he was asked to have a fast of silence, which was a method of fasting in the people of Bani Israel. So Allah ordered him that when you have, when the when your wife uh, has conceived, and when you've got this news of uh, the the birth of your son, this as a gratitude to show the gratitude for receiving this good news. You need to do what you need to worship Allah by having a fast of silence. And even while you are in a state of silence during the fast, keep on doing what? Glorifying Allah, remembering Allah, exalting Allah while you are fasting. And the second, uh, which has been explained, the second meaning which has been explained in certain commentaries is that Allah told Hazrat, uh, Hazrat uh, Zakriya salam, that the sign of the pregnancy or the conception will be that when the when the wife will hold the conception, Hazrat Zakriya salam, speech will be withheld and suspended for three days. That is, as a sign of conception, Three days he will not be able to speak. But despite the fact that he will not be able to speak, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered him that when he will have this sign of failure to be able to speak, then to show his gratitude for conception and showing Allah the gratitude for the blessing of this pregnancy, he should remember Allah by glorifying him, exalting him, and by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what we learn is that when what Quran teaches us that when we are blessed by a blessing and a bounty of Allah, we need to do what? We need to worship him. We need to praise him. We need to glorify him. And the method of expressing the gratitude to Allah is glorifying and exalting Allah. That is exactly what Prophet Sallallahu has been taught and instructed in Surah Nasr also, where Allah mentioned about the conquest of Makkah and the victory of, from, of the Muslims. He said, that Prophet وسلم, when you come out with the spectacular victory of the conquest of Makkah, you do what? You just do not rejoice. You do what? You praise Allah, you glorify Allah. So this is a method of expressing verbal gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And mention when the angel said, O Maryam alayhi salam, indeed Allah has chosen you and purified you and chosen you above the women of the world. And O Maryam, be devoutly obedient to your Lord and prostrate and bow with those who bow in the prayers. So now when Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam was chosen, she was chosen for what? She has, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the angel said and called out to Maryam alayhi salam that she was among the chosen people, chosen among the whole of the worlds. How was she chosen has been explained in a tradition of Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam that he said that five women were perfect. Five women were perfect. And he said, Hazrat Asya, the wife of Iran, Hazrat Maryam, the mother of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, Hazrat Khadija, the first wife of Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. And then he said Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and Hazrat Fatima bint Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So in some traditions, we learn the name of four women other than Hazrat Khadija, Hazrat Fatima. And in other tradition, in the four, we learn the name of Hazrat uh, Aisha. Anha. So this makes a list of five 
perfected women in one, uh, one of them is whom Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam. So Allah chose Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam. And when he chose Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam, what did she, what was she expected to do? And what was she enjoined to do? Number one, we need to understand all this because when we need to realize this, that when Allah chooses the Muslim women, what are they supposed to and expected to do? Do you know of any chosen women? Do you know of any Muslim women who have been chosen? Yes, Alhamdulillah. By the grace of Allah, by the blessings and mercy of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen all of us, has chosen all of us to go through these sessions of Quran, to sit and to learn and to listen and to understand and to comprehend the messages of Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen us. So what we need to learn is that when Allah chooses the Muslim women, what do these chosen Muslim women have to do? The first thing is purify yourself. Purify yourself. Because we know iman purification is half of faith and half of iman. And we know in Allah those who purify, Allah loves them. They are in the list of the beloved people of Allah. So if Allah chooses Muslim women, they need to purify themselves. They need to purify their bodies by their wudu, by their bath of purification. And they need to purify their dresses, their garments from all forms of physical filth or impurities. And they need to purify their clothes, their garments from all forms of arrogance, from wastefulness, from extravagance, from any form of vulgarity, immorality, or from the resemblance for the resemblance of their dresses and garments with, their, with, the, with males and with the non-Muslims. And they need to purify their garments from all form of vulgar manner. And they need to purify their dresses and make them what? A dress of piety, libas or taqwa. And all the chosen women, they need to keep their language, their conversation pure, pure and safe and clean from all form of telling of lies and bragging and boasting and showing off and exhibition and demonstration. And they need to keep their conversations pure and clean from all forms of backbiting and slander and mocking and taunting and hurting and dishonoring and disrespecting those around us. And we need to keep our gaze, our sights pure. And we need to keep our hearts pure from all the filth, from all the filth of arrogance, of envy, of jealousy, of mutual grudges and grievances, harsh and hard feelings for those around us. And we need to purify our hearts and souls from the love of, from the love of the wealth, from the love and lust of the world from selfishness, from miserliness, from hypocrisy. We need to keep our, our hearts pure from all these things. And then the chosen women, they need to do what? They need to be devoutly obedient to Allah. So that is what we need to do, to stay obedient to Allah, to surrender to Allah, to submit to the teachings and the messages of Allah, and to do what? To prostrate to prostrate and to bow down and to establish and to protect and to take care and guard our salah. That is from the news of the unseen with which we reveal to you and you were not with them when they cast their pens as to which of them should be responsible for Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam, nor were you with them when they, they disputed. <clears throat> so what is this? <clears throat> now what happened was that when all the people in the time of Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam, they received the news of her piety, of her, of her modesty, of her righteousness. So what happened was seeing such a pious, such a pious, a righteous maiden who had been presented for the service of the religion of Allah, 
all the servants of the heckle, all the servants of the heckle, they wanted and they desired to be the caretakers for Maryam alayhi salam. Now, they having this desire of uh, taking up the responsibility of the caretaker of Maryam alayhi salam, they proposed impossible suggestions for choosing the caretaker. So they, they made a suggestion that they will all drop their pens in the flowing streams and who, whoever's pen will flow against the flow of the stream. Then that person will be chosen as the kafil, as the caretaker of the guardian of Maryam alayhi salam. So what happened was they planned makaru wa makarullah. They planned that they could be chosen and they planned that Zakaria alayhi salam could be deprived. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plans what he plans is the best planning. And whatever he plans, he conducts the he conducts the situations and miracles to conduct his miracle, to conduct his planning. So miraculously, miraculously by the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pen of uh, Hazrat Zakaria alayhi salam, when it was thrown down in the water, it started flowing against the stream of water. And so by this miraculous happening, by the planning of Allah, Hazrat Zakaria alayhi salam was appointed as the guardian, as the kafil and the caretaker of Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam. And this was, this was the help, the support, the protection of Allah, which was extended for Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam. She received the help of Allah and she was extended the care of Hazrat Zakriya alayhi salam. Hazrat Zakriya, he happened to be the maternal uncle to Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam. And he was also a prophet. And moreover, he was also childless. So by the help of Allah, she happened to receive the love and affection and also the religious training from a prophet Zakriya alayhi salam. This is what? This is the mercy of Allah. This is the love, help, support, guidance and protection of Allah, which Allah extends for whom? For whom? Those who are obedient to him, those who are patient for, for his obedience, those who rely on him, and those who present themselves sincerely for the service of his religion of Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, help us remember all this, help us relate to all this, and help us adopt all this. And when we adopt all this mannerism, Allah protect us, Allah help us, Allah support us, Allah guide us for all that is the best. And then Allah accept from us our deeds and our, our services, which we do extend to a minimal extent for the service of Islam. Verse number 45, and mentioned when the angel said, O Maryam alayhi salam, indeed Allah gives you good tidings of a word from him whose names will be, will, whose name will be Masih, Isa alayhi salam, the son of Maryam alayhi salam, distinguished in this world and hereafter and among those brought near to Allah. So here in this verse, after the whole narration, now is the part of the birth of Hazrat, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. The angel gave the news and the tidings of the birth as Kalimatullah. Kalimatullah means Hazrat Isa alayhi salam because the birth of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam was with a miracle. The birth was without miraculously without a father with a, with a kalima with a word of kun, fayakun. So this was the kalima, the word of kun from Allah was the mir miracle kalima. And that is why Hazrat Isa alayhi salam has been called as kalimatullah in Quran and also even in Injil. And here he, his name has been mentioned as Masih. Hazrat Isa alayhi salam has been called as Masih in Quranic verses. And it means, it refers to, the first meaning is, Masi means a person who travels. Sayah, the Masi is the person who travels. He has been called by this name because he used to travel all around to preach and to teach the verses revealed to him. And Masi is also from Mim Sinha. Masaha means to rub. 
and he used to rub his hand. He was given the miracle by Allah that he used to rub his hands and he used to cure the congenital blind and he used to cure the lepers. And then he used to rub his hand on the dead and they used to be they used to be raised and given life by the order of Allah. So these miracles of rubbing, because of that, he was called as Masi. And another thing of rubbing was that the people of Bani Israel, they to give him respect and regard. It was their custom that if they had to give respect and regard to a person, they would they would make him have a seat and they used to rub or massage oil in his hair. So to give respect or regard to Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. Uh, because he was, uh, he memorized, he had in his memory all of the Torah. So to give respect and regard to Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, they used to massage oil and rub oil in his hair. And that is why also he was known as Masih. And then he has been called as Isa ibn Maryam. This is also many times in Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls him ibn Maryam, the son of Maryam alayhi salam. This means what? This actually, the calling of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam by the name of Ibn Maryam, the son of Maryam, means what? This proves the miraculous birth of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam being without a father. The without father miraculous birth of Quran of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam has been proven when he is being called as Ibn Maryam. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself has enjoined upon all the believers that they should be called by the name of these fathers. As is said in a verse of Quran, that you call your children by addressing them by the name of their fathers. So if there had been a father to Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, he would have been called by the name of his fathers, by the orders of Allah. Now, since he did not have a father and he was born as a miracle without a father, he was associated with the name of his mother repeatedly in Quran. He will speak to the people in the cradle and in maturity and will be of the righteous. So these are a few miracles now. In the next verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be mentioning the few miracles which were blessed to Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. The first being mentioned here is that he will speak in the cradle. And this was a miracle. This was a miracle, and it has also been proved by hadith also that Prophet ﷺ has been reported in a true hadith in, uh, in Bukhari that Prophet ﷺ said that there were three children. There were three children who talked or who spoke in the cradle. One of them was Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. When was this? This was when Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam gave birth to a fatherless son. To the fatherless son, Ruhullah, Kalimatullah, Hazrat Isa ibn Maryam. And then she carried the baby back to her people. She had shifted over to Baitul Laham for her delivery. And when she came back to her people carrying this baby without a father, without being married, when she came back, obviously there was to be uh, there was to be a roar of allegations and accusations against her, her father, her brother, her mother, and that was expected. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala instructed Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam to stay quiet and not to answer back and to say that she was in a fast of silence. So she exactly obeyed Allah Subhanahu wa Taala despite the fact that it was a very difficult uh, order of Allah to obey. And it seemed like not a practical solution to the condition, but she obeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we will we will go through all this when we are going through the verses of Surah Maryam, inshallah. And when she obeyed the suggestion which was given to her by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the help and the mercy and the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came. And when they were accusing her and when they were coming out with allegations against her, she quietly pointed towards the baby. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala miraculously blessed with this baby in her lap, blessed the baby with the power to talk. And Hazrat Isa alayhi salam told what? Inni Abdullah wa Rasulahu, that I am the servant of Allah and I am his prophet. So this was a miracle to save, 
to save the reputation of Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam. And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps, supports, protects the modest, helps, supports all those who are obedient, patient, and reliant. And the second uh, baby who spoke in the lap of the mother, we relate from the words of Hadith is that there was a woman who had a baby in her lap and she was nursing and feeding the baby. That she saw that a person who was on a horse, a young, youthful, beautiful, smart person, and he was very arrogant and he was riding a white Arabic stallion and was going in, in vanity. She looked at the person and she prayed and she supplicated that Allah make my son like this. Immediately did the baby leave the breast and the baby talked out and said, Allah may do not make me like this. Do not make me like this vain, proud, arrogant person. So then there after some time, a person who was a slave passed in front of that woman. She was still nursing the baby and the person was being beaten, was being beaten up badly by the master and he was being persecuted. And the woman immediately supplicated that Allah do not make my son like this. The baby again left the breast and he, he said, the baby called out that instead Oh Allah, instead of me, if you have to make me like any one of the two, instead of that arrogant person riding on the horse with full pride and vanity, make me like this person. So the baby preferred being a humbled person to being an arrogant person. So this was a person, a baby who, who, who talked in the lap of the mother. And then there was another baby. The story, Prophet Salaam recited the story, uh, narrated the story of Juraj. Juraj was a person, uh, a very pious and a righteous person from the Bani Israel. And he used to worship in his chamber, in his secret private chamber, he used to worship. One day, his mother was, uh, was not a believer. And one day when he was uh, making his supererogatory salah in his, in his worship chamber, his mother called out to him. But because he was in a state of salah, he did not answer his mother. And the mother was furious and she was angry and she made a supplication for her son that he may face or he may come across an adulteress of the town. So according to the supplication of the mother, a few days later, an adulteress came over to him and she invited him to zina or to adultery. But he, because of the fear of Allah, he refused to accept the, uh, the invitation of that immoral woman. And this uh, this made her furious and she went to a shepherd and where she had an illicit relationship for where she conceived and when she gave birth to the baby she she <clears throat> to take her revenge from Juraj, she labeled that the baby was Juraj's baby and when the people found out that he, despite the fact that he used to keep on worshiping and he posed that he was very pious and righteous, he was committing, he was involved in such immoral deeds and he was so immodest to can, uh, to uh, be adultering with such a woman. So they ran to him and they beat him up and they broke his, uh, his worship chamber also. When they were doing all this, he was so upset, he was so anxious that he again stood up in Salah and he was making a supererogatory Salah that with the help of Allah, how he helps, he supports, he protects those who are modest, those who are God-fearing and pious, that by the will and order of Allah, that baby, that baby who had been labeled with this, as a son of Juraj, that baby called out and he spoke out the name of his actual father while he was in the mother's lap. And then when the people realized that they had done wrong and they had, uh, they had, been, uh, they had wronged Juraj, they came back and they asked for forgiveness. And they also asked him that if he wants, they would build him, they would build him up a golden chamber for his worship. But never being lustful and never being greedy and never having any form of love for the for the riches and the gold and silver of this wealthy life he just requested them to make to help him reconstruct his uh, prayer chamber and this was the story of the child the third child who conversed while he was in the lap of the mother 
So Allah says that he will speak with the people in the cradle and also in which? In maturity. So now here in this verse and also many other similar verses of Quran does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention that Hazrat Isa alayhi salam will converse and will talk to people in maturity. But we also learn from the verses of Quran and from the traditions that Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, when the people of his, uh, when the people of his period, they had conspired against him and they had decided to crucify him. Then what happened was by the will and the order of Allah, people had planned to crucify him. We will be inshallah getting across, coming across these verses soon in the today's lesson also. They had planned to crucify him by the order and the will of Allah. Allah planned and so raised Hazrat Isa salam, completely with his body and soul to the heavens. And there, from there, he was raised before the age of maturity, that is before the age of 40 years. So now Allah says in Quran that he will converse to people at the age of 40 years. How will that be? The age of Kahulat. The age of Kahulat is more than the age of 40 years. How will that be possible? How would that be possible when he was raised to the heavens before the age? These verses, these verses, similar verses which say that he will converse with people at the age of more than the age of 35 to 40 years, they prove they prove the concept of descent of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam before the day of judgment. This is what these are. This is one of the major signs of resurrection, the descent of Isa alayhi salam. The descent of Isa alayhi salam before the day of resurrection is one of the major signs of resurrections. That is the descent of Isa alayhi salam will be after the appearance of Hazrat Imam Mahdi and after the appearance of Antichrist or the Jal. And it is these verses which serve as a proof for this truth. She said, my Lord, how will I have a child when no man has touched me? The angel said, such is Allah. He creates what he wills. When he decrees a matter, he only says to it, kun fayakun, be and it is. <coughs> Verse number 48, and he will, who? Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, the son of Maryam alayhi salam, when she was being given the news of his birth, the angel is introducing the manners and the traits of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. And he will teach him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will teach him, whom Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, writing and wisdom and Torah and Injil. We uh, learn from traditions that uh, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam was gifted with hifs of Torah, and he used to answer the scholars of Torah with uh, while he used to while they used to refuse him. The scholars of Torah, the Jew scholars, they used to refuse in accepting uh, and believing the prophethood of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam and the messages and the revelations which he was giving to them. When they used to refuse them, then to refute them and to answer them back, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam used to quote the verses of Torah then himself to and to make him a messenger to the children of Israel who will say indeed indeed I have come to you with a sign from your Lord in that I design for you from clay that which is like the form of a bird and then I breathe into it and it becomes a bird by the permission of Allah and I cure the blind and the lepers and I give life to the dead by the permission of Allah and I inform you of what you eat and what you store in your houses indeed in that is a sign for you if you are the believers so in this verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned all the miracles which were blessed to have Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, but repeatedly is it mentioned that it was not by the effort of the Prophet himself that he had succeeded in acquiring these miracles, but these miracles were blessed to him by the order and by the will of Allah. And I have come confirming what was before me of Torah and 
to make lawful for you some of what was forbidden to you. And I have come to you with a sign from your Lord, so fear Allah and obey me. Indeed, Allah is my Lord and your Lord, so worship him. That is the straight path. But when Isa salam, felt persistence in disbelief from them, he said, Man ansuari illallah, who are my supporters for the cause of Allah? The disciples, they said, Havari, they said, we are the supporters of Allah. Nahnu ansuarullah, we have believed in Allah and testify that we are Muslims submitting to him. So now the verse explained, then when the people around Hazrat Isa they were continuously invited by Hazrat Isa towards faith on Allah, oneness of Allah, towards faith on the scripture he was presenting, towards the faith of his prophethood, they do not did not respond to his call. They did not respond to his call and they were obstinately and they were stubbornly in full arrogance. They continued and they persisted in a state of disbelief. So finally, he called out for help, saying what? Man ansuari illallah, who will be helpful for me in the path of Allah? Now, there were, there were companions who came out. Allah has called them as Havari. The Havari means what? They were those who came out as the companions helpful to Hazrat Isa They were a group of 20 people. These were the disciples of Hazrat Isa You know what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has liked their response, has liked the way they responded to the call of Hazrat Isa The call was man ansari illallah. And they responded by saying, nahnu ansarullah. It was this response. It was this behavior. It was this mannerism of the people, of uh, the, the disciples, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala liked so much that Allah has mentioned it in Surah Al-Imran. Allah has mentioned it in one of the, one of the greatest surahs of Quran. And Allah has Allah has let their let their story be in Quran till the day of judgment. So the lesson we learn from this is that what Allah likes the best from the bondsmen, what pleases Allah the most from the bondsmen, which behavior He likes the best, the which manner He likes the best is, which response pleases Him the most is that when people are called. When somebody calls for the service of the religion of Islam, for the teaching, for the preachings of the messages of Quran and Hadith, for the implementation and for the guarding of the messages and the laws of Quran, when somebody is called out for that, the person responds out. The person responds by saying, Nahnu ansuarullah, that we will be the helpers for all these activities. Allah wants this response from his bondsmen that whenever, wherever, whoever calls for the help of preaching, teaching, implementation, and protection of Quran, the response should be an affirmative. The response should be an affirmative and the help should be extended to all those working for this, for this excellent cause. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us one of them. Our Lord, they said, these disciples who had said, they said, our Lord, we have believed in what you revealed and have followed the messengers, the message, uh, the messenger, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. So register us among the witnesses to truth and the disbelievers planned. But Allah planned and Allah is the best of planners. Now, who planned, what was planned and against who was it all planned? Now, what happened was that when 20 companions responded to the call of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, and then they became a group of 21 people, this created a feeling of fear. This created a feeling of distress and anxiety among the rulers and the common people of the time. This shows what? This shows the power of the believers. This shows the power and the force of the believers. Just a handful group of 20 people did the, did the rulers, they started fearing. 
So now once the rulers, they were insecure and they were fearing this group of fanatics, they planned to crucify Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. And the allegations for crucifying him were two. They, uh, the allegations were they accused him of revolt against the rulers, number one, and they were accusing him from reverting from the ancestral religion. So they, they thought that he, they, he was a revolt, he was a rebel, he was a rebel of the government, and he was a rebel of the religion of the ancestors also. So Hazrat Isa alayhi salam and his companions, when he found, when they found out the plan of the government and the rulers to crucify Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, so they had to take out, hide out in the caves. So Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, accompanied by his companions, they took hide out in the caves. But one out of the twenty disciples betrayed. He was like the black sheep of the lot, and he let out the secret of the hideout. They planned, even this person planned, even the army planned, even the rulers planned, makaru wa makarullah, they all planned, the betrayer planned, and the enemies planned, and the disbelievers planned, and the rulers planned, but their plans could not be conducted. The plans of Allah Almighty was which was conducted. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as a punishment to this person who had betrayed, as a punishment, we learn from the commentaries, the appearance of this person who had betrayed and who had let out the secret of the hideout, his appearance was changed and he resembled Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. So the soldiers of the army, they considering him Hazrat Isa alayhi salam because of his appearance, his physical appearance, which had been created by the order of Allah. He was caught by the soldiers and then he was crucified. He was put to crucifixion and it was this, this betrayer of the disciples who was crucified. And so the people, so the people, they started believing that Hazrat Isa alayhi salam had been crucified. And this is what has been negated in these verses also, that it was not Hazrat Isa alayhi salam who was crucified. It was that disbeliever who had betrayed and had been punished and had been put to the crucifixion. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had done what? <coughs> That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had raised Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. He had raised Hazrat Isa alayhi salam both with his body and his souls to the heaven to be sent, to be sent down again before the day of judgment as a major sign of the resurrection. So he was raised to heaven both with body and soul. So this is all being explained as an answer to the question which was put forward by the deputation of the religious scholars of Nijran. Mentioned when Allah said, O Isa alayhi salam, indeed I will take you and raise you to myself and purify you from those who disbelieve and make those who follow you in submission to Allah alone superior to those who believe who disbelieve until the day of resurrection, then to me is your return, and I will judge between you concerning that in which you used to differ. And as for those who disbelieve, I will punish them with a severe punishment in this world, and hereafter they will have no helpers. So this is a punishment which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning for whom the disbelievers of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, that is the Jews. <coughs> But as for those who believed and did righteous deeds, he will give them in full their rewards. And Allah does not like the wrongdoers. This is what we recite to you of our verses and the precise and the wise message. Indeed, the example of Isa alayhi salam to Allah is like that of Adam alayhi salam. He created him from dust, whom? Adam alayhi salam. And then he said to him, be, and he was. Now, explaining and narrating the events in the life and in the, during the birth of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam and Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam, just amidst the whole of the events, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning about the creation of Hazrat Adam alayhi salam has been quoted. Why? Because, you know, because of the fatherless birth of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, 
the Christians, they had fabricated the false belief and they had started calling Hazrat Isa as Ibnullah, the son of Allah. And then after that, they started calling uh, Hazrat Isa as Allah, the deity himself. And this was all triggered because of uh, the concept that Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, he was born without a father. So Allah, Nauzubillah, Minzalik was his father. And then the false innovations of Ibnullah followed this basic reason. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that Hazrat Adam alayhi salam, Hazrat Adam alayhi salam was created from trust, miraculously without a mother, without a father, so if his miraculous creation without a father and without a mother did not end up making him or imagining him as an Allah or as a deity or as a son of Allah, then why do the Christians fabricate Hazrat Isa as a son of Allah? So this is why Hazrat Adam salam's creation has been mentioned to explain the, the control, the authority, the sovereignty of Allah as a creator and to negate and to refute the false concept of Trinity of the Christians. The truth is from your Lord. So do not be among the, among the doubters. Then whoever argues with you about it after this knowledge has come to you, say, so this is this verse was revealed after all the verses, all the previous verses from verse number 32 till this verse, they were revealed as an answer to the question of the deposition of uh, Nijran. The scholars, they asked, and all these verses were revealed, and Prophet Sallallahu had recited these verses to them, explaining exactly what the events during the birth of Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, and what he had asked his disciples to do, and what is the actual and the true concept of uh, the concept of uh, Hazrat uh, Isa alayhi salam, and uh, negating the concept of Trinity, all these verses, when they were clearly narrated and recited in front of the deputation, despite listening to the events, all these verses, the people of Nijran, they failed to believe. They very obstinately, they very stubbornly and arrogantly, despite, to, despite they listening to all the true verses and the true events, they failed to believe and they did not believe. So here in this verse, Prophet Wasallam was guided how to make a method to make them accept the truth. So it was suggested that tell them that come, let us call our sons and your sons, our women and your women, ourselves and yourselves, and then supplicate earnestly together and invoke the curse of Allah upon the liars among us. So this technique was suggested to uh, Prophet Sallallahu that you suggest to the people of Nijran to come in an open ground and you bring all of yourselves and we, I, Prophet Sallallahu I come with my family and with my family members and we supplicate to Allah that the curse be upon the liars. So this was an open challenge and the people of Nijran, they had actually they had actually re recognized Prophet Sallallahu and they had believed in hearts of hearts, but out of sheer obstinacy and out of sheer arrogance did they fail to believe. And they knew that if they supplicated for curse for the liar, the curse would come out on them. So despite realizing the actual truth and the actual state of affairs, they arrogantly returned and they did not comply to this suggestion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showing directly that despite realizing the fact of the true fact, they were being arrogant and they were still persisting in this state of disobedience. Indeed, this is the true narration, and there is no deity except Allah. And indeed, Allah is the exalted in might and exalted in the wise. But if they turn away, then indeed Allah is knowing of the corruptors. Say, O people of the scripture, come to a word, come to a word that is equitable between you and us, that we will not worship except Allah and not associate anything with him and not take one another as lords instead of Allah. 
But if they turn away, then say, be a witness that we are Muslims submitting to him. So in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is instructing, instructing Prophet sallallahu the companions, and even all of us indirectly, the way and the manner to invite the people of the book. The people of the book are being invited for faith on Prophet sallallahu and on the Quran, highlighting the common things between common things between the teachings of Prophet sallallahu and the teachings of their divine scriptures. The common points are being highlighted that you, the Jews and the Christians, you also believe in Allah. You also believe in the prophets and the divine scriptures. You also believe in angels and you also believe in the day of judgments. So highlighting the common points to invite them for belief in Prophet Sallallahu and the Quran. So this verse indirectly is teaching all of us a style of preaching, a style of inviting, a style of dava. That is rather than, rather than highlighting the differences, rather than highlighting the differences, we need to highlight the common concepts, the common points. This is a hikmah of calling out even the different sects. Today we see that there are different sects in, in the followers of Prophet Sallallahu So to take away the differences of opinion in all the clashes, the, the grievances, the grudges of all the different sects of the Muslims, we need to highlight we need to highlight the common concepts and the common points rather than magnifying the differences. This is a very clear cut wisdom and hikmah for all forms of invitation towards Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us adopt this hikmah of invitation and dawah. O people of scripture, why do you argue about Ibrahim alayhi salam while the Torah and Injil were not revealed? until after him, then will you not reason? Here you are, those who have argued about that of which you have some knowledge, but why do you argue about that of which you have no knowledge? And Allah knows, while you know not, Ibrahim salam was neither a Jew nor a Christian, but he was one inclining towards the truth, a Muslim submitting to Allah, and he was not of the polytheists. Indeed, the most worthy of Ibrahim salam, among the people are those who followed him in submission to Allah and his prophet and this prophet whom Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and those who believe in his message and Allah is the ally of the believers. A faction of the people of the scriptures, they wish they could mislead you, but they do not mislead except themselves, and they perceive it not. O oh, people of the scripture, why do you disbelieve in the verses of Allah while you witness to the truth? This is what? You know, the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians in Torah and Injil, the New and the Old Testaments, they definitely mention they mention the name of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the name of his father, of his mother, of the city where he, will, where, where he will be born and the city where he will migrate. The names of those have been mentioned in the scriptures and the different uh, identifications have been mentioned and the behaviors and the manners of the companions and of the roles of their congregational salah to this perfection. They have been mentioned in the previous scriptures. So they had been promised by their prophets also that the seal of prophets, Rahmatullah will be sent down. And they were taken promises and pledged by Allah and by their prophets that they will believe in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they will believe in him, support him and help him. But they had realized they had recognized Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by all the things which were mentioned in their books. But despite the fact out of sheer obstinacy and arrogance, they failed to have faith. They failed to have faith in Prophet Sallallahu and Quran. And not only this, that they were disbelievers to both, they also misguided other people, like the people of Quraysh. 
they were the unlettered, they were illiterate, and the Bedouins of Mecca and Medina, when they found out and they heard about what Prophet Wasallam used to say, they out of curiosity and trying to reconfirm, they used to go to the people of the book. And they used to say that you have divine scriptures and you being the people and the followers of prophets, you know what Allah says and how Allah reveals. What do you have to say about Prophet Sallallahu And what do you have to reconfirm about what he is presenting as a revolution and as a scripture of Allah? So despite the fact that they had realized and despite the fact they knew the truth of all these things, they would conceal and they would not reveal and they would misguide and they would not guide and they would announce against the truth. So this is what they've been warned against. Oh, people of the scripture, why do you conf confuse the truth with falsehood and conceal the truth while you know it? And a faction of the people of scripture say to each other, believe in that which was revealed to the believers at the beginning of the day and reject it at its end. Perhaps they will abandon their religion. This was also one of the defaming tricks of the Jews of Medina. What the Jews of Medina used to do out of planning and out of trick, they used to ask their Jew companions to embrace Islam and to announce in Medina that they had announced and declare in Medina that they had embraced Islam. And then to mix up with the Muslims, to stay with them, to attend their sessions. And then after some day, after a day or so, or a few days, then to revert back to Jewism. This they wanted to do, why? To create an impression and to create the impact that they, the people of the book, they, the literates, they, the knowledgeables, if they, after observing and after experiencing this message of, or this religion of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they have reverted back to their original religion of Jewism, then obviously and very obviously there must be something wrong. There must be something wrong. There must be some fault. There must be some falsehood in the message which Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is presenting. This was what? This was the behavior and the mannerism of the Jews and the Christians in those times. It was an anti-Islam effect. Remember, in all the ages, in all the times, in all the periods, even now and till, even till the day of judgment, the Jews, the Muslims, the Jews, the Christians, all the anti-Islam powers and forces, they will keep on trying to defame Islam, the messages and the teachings of Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make us one of them, choose us to be one of them who try to work against all these allegations, who try to raise their voice against all these defaming tactics and all these anti-Islam activities. And do not trust except those who follow your religion say indeed the true guidance is the guidance of Allah. Do you fear lest someone be given knowledge like you were given or that they would thereby argue with you before your Lord? Say, indeed, all bounty is in the hand of Allah. He grants it to whom he wills, and Allah is all-encompassing and wise. He selects for his mercy whom he wills, and Allah is the possessor of great bounty. Allah, select all of us for your mercy, for your pleasure, for your love, for your nearness, and for your bounties. And among the people of scripture is he who, if you entrust him with a great amount of wealth, he will return to you. These verses, this part of the verse we generally learn from uh, the commentaries, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has appraised the behavior of uh, Hazrat Abdullah bin Salam. And among them is he who, if you entrust him with a single silver coin, he will not return to you unless you are constantly standing over him demanding it. That is because they say, who? The Jews. They say, there is no blame upon us concerning the unlearned, and they speak untruth about Allah while they know it. But yes, whoever fulfills his commitments and fears Allah, 
whoever fulfills his commitment and fears Allah, then indeed Allah loves those who fear him. Allahumma ja'alna minhum, Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha, Allahumma inni as'aluka al-quda, wal-tuqa, wal-afafa, wal-ghina. Allahumma inni as'aluka hubbaka wa hubba min yuhibbuka wa amal al-lazi yuballighuni hubbaka. Indeed, those who exchange the covenant of Allah and their own oaths for a small price. With small price, the price of the worldly gains, the worldly advantages, the interests of the world. Those who exchange the covenant of Allah and their own oaths for a small price will have no share in hereafter. And Allah will not speak to them or look at them on the day of resurrection, nor will purify them and they will will have a painful punishment. We know that wherever in the verses of Quran or in the traditions of a hadith, wherever these this word, these words are being saying, are being mentioned that Allah will not speak to them or look at them and will not purify them, then that that deed becomes what? It will be considered as a major sin. So what is a major sin? Is breaking the covenants of Allah and and giving away to the pledges and oaths and breach of promise or breach of pact. And indeed, there is among them a party who alter the scripture with their tongues. So you may think it is from the scripture, but it is not from the scripture. And they say this is from Allah, but it is not from Allah. And they speak untruth about Allah while they know it is not for a human prophet that Allah should give him the scripture and authority and prophethood. And then he would say to the people, be servants to me rather than Allah. This is what? This is negating all concepts of trinity and the false innovations created by the jews and the christians regarding their prophets he would not say to the people be servants to me rather than allah but instead he would say be pious scholars of the lord because of what you have taught of the scripture and because of what you have studied nor could he who a prophet nor could he order you to take the angels and prophets as lords would he order you to disbelieve after you had been Muslims? And recall, recall of people of scripture when Allah took the covenant of the prophets saying, whatever I give you of the scripture and wisdom, and then there comes to you a messenger confirming what is with you. You must believe in him and support him. Allah said, have you acknowledged and taken upon that my commitment? All of them, the prophets, all of them, they said, we have acknowledged it. He said, then bear witness, and I am with you among the witnesses. Now, in this verse 81, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning his covenant with the prophets. When was this? This was at the time of the pledge with the creator, at the time of the pledge with the sustainer. We do learn from the verses of Quran and from traditions also that before the creation of the universe and before the creation of mankind, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created, created all the human beings which had to be created from Hazrat Adam alayhi salam to the last person on the day before the day of judgment. And they were presented and they were collected and gathered before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on his throne. And then Allah asked them, it has been mentioned in Quran, in the verses of Quran, Allah asked them, Allah to be rabbikum, am I not your sustainer? And they all agreed. It is mentioned in the verses of Quran. They all answered. They were all, there was a unanimous answer that why not? That meant what? That they all agreed and they made a covenant that they will be taking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they had agreed that Allah is their sustainer, the creator. Now, after this, after this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took a direct covenant with the prophets and the messengers. And this was also an indirect covenant with all the followers also, that when after the, after the prophet and after the messenger, there would be an, another prophet sent, then all the believers and all the, all the believers and all the followers of the previous prophet would believe, would believe in the succeeding prophet. 
would believe in the succeeding prophet and what he presents. And not only would they believe in the prophet who came after their prophet, would they believe in him, they would support him, and they would respect and regard him. So this was a covenant made by all the prophets and all the messengers and indirectly by all their followers also. Now, this was a covenant which is being mentioned here in this Surah Al-Imran. Why? Because the Jews and the Christians, because of this covenant, they were duty bound. They were duty bound to have faith and believe in Prophet Sallallahu and Quran. They were duty bound to believe in Prophet Sallallahu and Quran. And not only that, they were duty bound because of this covenant. They were duty bound to help and support him also. But on the contrary, totally opposite to that, they were failing to believe and they were also opposing. And they were also on fighting terms with Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that is why they have been reminded of the covenant their, their, their prophets had made, and they had also agreed to it in their books and in their divine scriptures. And now how were they supposed to behave because they were supposed to fulfill the covenant and how actually they were, being behave they were behaving. So they have been shown their behavior, negating their covenant with Allah. And whoever turned away after that, they were the defiantly disobedient. So it is, so is, so is it other than the religion of Allah they desire while to him have submitted all those within the heavens and the earth willingly or by compulsion and to him they will be returned. Say, we have believed in Allah in what was revealed to us and what was revealed to Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ismail, Ishaq, Yaqub, and the descendants, and in what was given to Musa alayhi salam, and Isa alayhi salam, and to the prophets from their Lord. We make no distinctions between any of them, and we are Muslims submitting to him. We do what? All prophets had brought the religion of Islam. All prophets were Muslim. All the followers of the prophets were Muslims. And this is what way of Islam and faith and belief is being taught to the Jews and the Christians also. And whoever desires other than Islam as a religion never ever will it be accepted from him and he is in here after he will be among the losers how shall allah guide a people how shall allah guide a people who disbelieved after their belief and had witnessed that the messenger is true and clear signs had come to them and allah does not guide the wrong doing people those their recompense will be that upon them is the curse of allah and the angels and the people all together abiding eternally therein the punishment will not be lightened for them nor will they be reprieved except for those who repent after that and correct themselves for indeed allah is forgiving and merciful indeed those who reject the message after their belief and they increase in disbelief never will they never will never will their claimed repentance be accepted and they are the ones astray allahumma la taj'alna minhum indeed those who disbelieve and die while they are disbelievers never would the whole capacity of the earth in gold be accepted from one of them if he would seek to ransom himself with it for those there will be a painful punishment and they will have no helpers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning the behavior, the behavior of all the Jews and all the Christians, how they fail to believe despite their covenants with Allah. But here Allah is mentioning that all these people who fail to believe despite the fact they realize the truth, despite the fact that they recognized and received the truth, and still arrogantly and obstinately they fail to refuse, then on the day of judgment, if as a, as a source of releasing from the hellfire, to get released from hellfire if they would present as a ransom all the riches and the worlds in the world that will not be accepted for them. Remember, in this world, in this world, 
We need to do what? Astaghfirullah Rabbi min kulli zambin wa atubu like Repentance and forgiveness, seeking forgiveness will be a source of expiation and atonement for all the sins. And in this world, there will, in their hereafter, even if a person comes up for ransom with the whole of the world's riches, that will not be a ransom for the release from hellfire. But in this worldly life, Prophet Wasallam has told all of us that save yourselves from hellfire, even if by spending a fraction of the date. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, help us all, guide us all, protect us all, and teach us all the route and the path to Jannah. Allahumma inni as'alu qal jannatul firdaus rabbibni li'indaka baytan fil jannah Allahumma ajirna minan nar Allahumma ajirna minan nar Allahumma ajirna minan nar